When you spend as much time as I do making things, you end up with a lot of broken stuff. All right, this needs to be fixed. All right, what else we got here? A computer fan, that needs to be fixed. In fact, my workshop is full of broken things. I even have this broken chair. My name is Zach and I'm the Bite Size Engineer. In this video, we're talking about when to fix a gadget and when to toss it. Good thing that was already broken. Nailed it. In front of me, I've got three broken items. And the question is, should I fix these? Is it worth my time? Is it worth the money? And more importantly, if you have things like this at home, is it worth your time to fix them? So I'm gonna go through all three of these items and I'm gonna decide which is worth fixing. As an engineer, you know I'm gonna to try to open this up and fix it. And that's exactly what I did with this laptop. All of a sudden, it wouldn't take a charge, and so I tried a few things, and I thought that it was the charging port here on the side. So of course, I got my tools out, I stripped it down, opened it up, and looked at the circuit board. Once I decided that it was the charging connector that I thought was the problem, I took the time to order that replacement part, wait for it to come, and when it came, I got out the soldering iron and desoldered the old connector off the circuit board, put the new connector on, and guess what? It didn't work. I don't think you realize, I took this thing completely apart. After spending all of that time working on the power connector and desoldering it and replacing it and still not having a working computer, I decided that I was already in too deep and that I needed to continue further. It was like the sunk cost fallacy. I noticed that the cable had some kinks in it, so I thought there's probably a short there. So I took out my wire cutters and I cut out that short, stripped it back and soldered it back together, expecting that I had fixed the problem. But when I plugged it in, Still no dice. And I kept cutting the cable shorter and shorter and shorter until I ended up with a cable that was about six inches long and I still couldn't get it to work. I was so frustrated at this point. And I discovered through a lot of troubleshooting and more and more of my time that the problem was actually in the overmolding of this connector, which is not something you can easily fix. You would have to bust it open and it's, there's no guarantee at that point. So I went online and I got a replacement power supply and of course that fixed the problem and now I have a working laptop. And that was a huge lesson learned. I spent way too much time trying to fix this laptop when in the beginning I should have just spent a few extra bucks and bought a new power supply. Okay, moving on. The next thing I have are a set of wireless earbuds. There's a bit of an embarrassing story behind this. These earbuds ended up going through the washing machine and I won't say whose fault it was, but you know who you are. They went through the washing machine and after that they stopped working. They wouldn't take a charge. Being an engineer, of course, I had to open this thing up to see if I could fix it. So the first thing I discovered is that there is a little charging circuit on here. There's a little IC that does all of the charging uh, for the earbuds. And I thought, well, if something's broken, that's probably it. And the only way to fix that is to find a replacement part and to remove it from the board and replace it. So I went online trying to find a replacement part for this particular chip and I couldn't find it. So at that point, I remembered the lesson I had learned with the laptop cord, and I knew that I was already in too deep with this, and I said, you know what? I'm gonna cut my losses, and I'm just gonna order a new set of earbuds. The cost of the earbuds stung a little bit, but it was nothing compared to the amount of time I would have spent trying to fix this, and with no guarantee that they would work at the end. So I decided that it was time to toss these as well. I'm gonna get it one of these times. This is a gaming mouse that has 20 programmable buttons on the side. I don't use it for gaming, but I do use it for 3D modeling and doing circuit board design. This particular mouse has special meaning to me. It's actually the mouse that I bought when I was in college learning how to do 3D modeling and circuit board design, and I've had it for a really long time. And I really like the way it feels in my hand. I've gotten used to it. I've programmed the buttons just the way I like it. So I was really devastated when one day it just stopped working. I think one of the mouse buttons has given out. So I'm ready to open this thing up and do the same thing that I did on the first two and see if I can fix it. I've been taking stuff apart for a really long time, but I've been missing out on something. I really love these silicon mats that I found on DigiKey because they have these little compartments that are numbered. And anytime I'm taking screws out or different parts, I will place them in the numbered compartments. And that helps me when it's time to reassemble it because I can just go in reverse order and it cuts down on the confusion. To make things a little more interesting, I'm gonna pull my phone out and I'm gonna start a timer for two hours. If I can't fix this computer mouse within that two hour limit, it's not worth it and I'm gonna throw it in that trash can. Not 20 hours, two hours. Ready, 
set, go. As I flip over the mouse, I don't see any screws right away, but manufacturers are clever and they usually try to hide their screws. So my first thought is that these adhesive pieces are hiding some screws. When you're taking apart electronics and there is adhesive holding something together, one of the tips that I have learned over the years is to apply heat. So I've got a heat gun here and I'm gonna turn it on at a very low temperature and I'm going to warm up that adhesive so that it comes off much easier. If I try to skip this step and I brute force the adhesive, then it's just going to tear everything up and it's not gonna look good. The heat makes the adhesive soft and it makes it much easier to peel these things up. Yeah, you see how that came right off and now I can see the screws underneath. Now it's time to do the lower one. And I'm gonna use my little pry tool here. It's best to go slow and not try to rip everything off all at once. Okay, so that came off. Now I can use a screwdriver to remove those four screws. Like I said earlier, I'm gonna use the little slots in the mat to hold my screws. And if it's still being held together, that means you missed a screw. Don't try to force anything, go gentle, go slow and make sure that you don't damage the thing that you're trying to fix. Okay, so as I open this up, I'm careful because there's a little ribbon cable here. So I'm going to use my tweezers and gently open up that flat flex connector. Ooh. And it flew off. Luckily, that landed in my lap. Ugh. If I had misplaced that or lost it on the ground, I would have been in real trouble. But I've got that, I'm gonna put it in my mat. I can see a couple of clips holding the circuit board into the uh, enclosure. So I'm going to unclip those and carefully remove the PCB. Oh, there goes the mouse wheel on the ground. Let's pick that up. I guess that's just like sitting on there. There's no like electrical connection. I think it's an optical encoder. I'll need to be careful as I set that back in. So far, so good. I'm five minutes into my two hour challenge. All right, so this is the PCB. Here's the switch I need to remove. In this case, I'm gonna to try to replace the component on the board. So I need to know what part number it is. Most of the time, the part numbers are just written on the component itself. So if I look closely at this, I can see uh, the marking D2FC-F dash seven N. All right, I'm on the DigiKey website and I'm gonna type in that part number. It looks like these cost around 60 cents each, which is awesome. So I went ahead and I ordered 25 of those switches just because it was a little bit cheaper to get them at a quantity of 25. And also who knows, I may have other switches on this mouse brake. Uh, and so it's good to have these components on hand just in case. So I'm gonna start by showing you a couple of different tools and techniques that I use to remove through hole components off of circuit boards. If there are only two uh, leads going through the PCB, what I'll do is often I'll just get two soldering irons and as long as I have both of those solder joints heated up simultaneously, the part should just come right out. In this case, I have three, so that's a little bit more tricky. I don't have three soldering irons and more importantly, I don't have three arms to use three soldering irons, so I'm gonna have to get creative here. I'm going to try to create a big solder ball that will bridge two of those through hole pads so that I can heat it up using one iron. And then with my second iron, I'll heat up the third pad. And when you have larger pads like this and you need to apply a lot of heat, it's often really a good idea to change out your soldering iron tip for something that's a little bit bigger that can transfer more heat. This is gonna be a really frustrating process if you use a really thin tip that is not able to transfer a lot of heat. So what I end up doing, because I'm fortunate enough to have two soldering irons, is that I leave a large tip on one of them for jobs just like this, and then my regular everyday driver has a little bit smaller tip because I usually work on smaller things. So I'll go ahead and take my solder spool and I'm gonna tin my iron, try to get all of that oxidation off. And I'm also going to turn on my fume extractor because I'm generating a lot of fumes here that I don't wanna be breathing in. I'll position that here close by my work area. And yes, I know that's a little bit noisy, but it's more important that my lungs are safe. You see how I've created that big solder bridge there? Now I'm able to heat up both of those pads simultaneously. And sometimes I'll actually even get um, some flux and I'll add that in there because it just helps kind of reflow that solder a little bit, makes it a little bit cleaner and transfer the heat better. I've got all three pads heated up. <laughs> now I wish I had <laughs> some help getting this out because it, it started to fall out. Maybe what I ought to do is uh, actually lift it off of the, the workbench a little bit so I can let gravity help me out here. So I'll clamp this in 
to a little PCB vise. All right, give that a little jiggle or a little tap, ready? Did you see that? Came right out. I got lucky. That actually came out much easier than I was anticipating. Sometimes like giving it a little bit of a tap or a little bit of a nudge and letting gravity help you out obviously uh, works wonders. What's even better is actually just having somebody lend you a hand and uh, pulling that out after you get them all heated up. So now that we've got the part removed, it's important to clean out those through hole pads. So I'm going to use a solder sucking tool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my iron and I'm gonna heat up that pad from the bottom side of the board. And I'm looking from the top and I can see that it just reflowed. I've got my solder sucker ready. I'm gonna place that over there. And it sucked out a lot of that solder. All right, we'll go for round number two. It's important to clean out the little bits of solder that get inside the solder sucker every time. So I'll just give it a few little taps like that and it cleans it out. And then the third one, place this down flat, get a good seal. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. I am gonna switch over to some solder wick and heat that up and try to clean up these joints a little bit more. This is going to be so much easier now that I've got clean and clear holes. This new component should just slip right in and I should be able to install it as if this were a fresh board. So now let's see if I can get the new part in there. Let's see, that goes right in there and now I can tack this into place. I'm just gonna hold the part in and I'm gonna take my iron and I'm gonna add a bunch of solder to the tip here. This is not good soldering techniques, but I'm going to tack it in place first. And then once it's held in place, I can come back and fix the joint. And I'm actually picking the center one because I think that that first pad that's kind of a square footprint is probably a ground plane, which means it's connected to a lot of copper, which means that it's gonna take a lot more heat to heat up. So if I'm trying to tack something really quick, I don't wanna pick the pad that is connected to the copper plane, and then I have to uh, add a whole bunch of heat to even get it to reflow. All right, so that worked. I I'm gonna check my part here, make sure it's flush with the circuit board. Everything looks good, it's in the right orientation. And I'll go ahead and I will solder the other two joints. And now I can go back and I can fix that first joint just in case it was a cold solder joint. I'm gonna add a little bit more solder and reflow that just to get a good solid joint there. Let's see how we did on time. All right, stop. I have about an hour and 20 minutes left. That means that it only took me about 40 minutes to do this repair. But now the question is, does it even work? Let's head over to the computer and find out. Okay, where did that go? Right here. All right, I need to plug this into my computer and see if my repair worked. Here's the moment of truth. Okay, I'm gonna open up some software and it looks like it works. This button, works just fine now. And I did it all within the time limit that I set. And here's a sneak peek of a project that I'm working on for a future video. This mouse is working great, and this was totally worth my time. And now that I think about it, this whole process was very therapeutic for me. I had a pile of junk that didn't work, and I think I've come up with two key takeaways. Number one is that you need to take this apart. You're watching this video, which means you're a tinkerer like me, so that means you're comfortable with taking things apart. So always start by taking the thing apart that doesn't work. Number two is give it a quick assessment. Don't spend too long trying to figure out what's wrong. If you're spending two hours trying to troubleshoot or even attempting to fix it, you've already wasted too much time. It's not worth your time. Make your assessment quick. And you know what? I actually thought of a third takeaway, kind of a bonus takeaway. You really should take into account the cost to replace the item. For example, the power supply, I spent $44 on, and I spent probably six hours trying to fix it, which was way too long. So I came up with a simple rule of thumb that works for me. I'm only willing to spend one minute per dollar it costs to replace the item. By that logic, I should have only spent 44 minutes trying to fix that power supply, whereas I spent like six hours. But on the other hand, I bought the computer mouse for $55 about 10 years ago. I looked it up and they no longer make this model and it has a lot of sentimental value to me. So I allotted myself two hours even though I didn't spend that much time. After your quick assessment, the answer might be one of two things. It might be time to throw that thing in the trash or you may have figured out what's wrong with it and you're well on your way to fixing it. Taking something that was broken and making it work again 
you breathe new life into that item and it is super rewarding. To complete my therapy session with you today, I think it's time to get rid of this pile of electronics into the trash can. How did I make all of that in there? That was amazing. If you wanna learn more about troubleshooting electronics, you should check out this video where I show you how to use a thermal camera to troubleshoot your electronics. You know what, I actually changed my mind. I have some time next week that I'm gonna fix this chair. You know what, I think all I need to do is get like a piece of metal, but it has to be like a quarter inch thick and I have to...